Everybody welcome. Uh, we were just talking to Pete, and uh, Pete did the see-throughs for the song service this morning, and he got on the floor and says, I don't know if I'll ever get up. I said, well, just do it, and we'll pick you up later, or whatever happens. But he got up. He did great. Thank you very much. That was good. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the money's good. We're doing, it, we're doing word games and, um, tonight, and I hope that as these things go, you find it interesting. But in the first place, we pick up Bibles or, or whatever types of documents you may pick up. When you study religion or ancient religions, you run smack into Eastern concepts, you know, of ancient people. And the Eastern method of writing, which the Bible is a prime example, is for a, a purpose. And the purpose is to bring you to a higher level of understanding. That's the purpose of all of this. It is absolutely worthless for you to go in constantly into meditation if you have no idea what you're doing. I mean, it doesn't make a bit of sense because then when things happen to you, a lot of people, they go into meditation, something happens and they become frightened. Why? Because they don't understand what's supposed to happen. So they become scared. Oh, you know, I'm not going to touch that anymore. And they don't realize that there's changes. This morning we went through the six stages, the seven aspects of the human body, which went right through the physical, to the astral, to the causal, to the mental, to the etheric, to the soul, to God. And, and then leveled on each one of those, what each one of those do. And, you know, a lot of times you think when you go into normal church, well, I'm going to say a prayer to God. But you don't realize that you've got to communicate through those six other aspects of your being before you're ever going to get up to the top. So it's a lot more complex than what we've been led to think. And so we're just there standing in our ignorance wondering why we're not able to do anything. We're not dealing with those, um, those spiritual levels of our own being. See? So the point then, if you come here or if you're watching on television, have to reach a decision. And the decision that you have to make right now is are you interested in reaching a higher level of understanding? And I'll tell you something. You say, oh, well, everybody is. 90% of the people definitely are not. Most people would much prefer to come into a church, have some guy stand up here, tell you that Jesus did it all, all you got to do is claim it and you fly away. That means you don't have to do anything. So they understand nothing. They only know that they got to show up on Sunday for a couple hours, put 10% in, and they're going to fly off to heaven. They've accomplished nothing. They know nothing. In fact, they don't even suspect anything. And life has passed them by, and they have been deposited on the planet Earth. They die on the planet Earth, and in that intervening period of time, they have never even set foot on, uh, on that part of the pathway to knowledge to try to find out what in the world is my purpose and what am I supposed to do. So there's a responsibility that's placed on you. If you come to the conclusion that, yes, I'd like to reach a higher level of understanding, then you have a responsibility. To reach a higher level of understanding, you have to discipline yourself in two ways. One, meditation. You can't do without it. And two, listening. Very important. Listening, hearing. Whether you call if you, 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 you talk from a guru or from a teacher, whomever, there has to be someone. You can listen within yourself, but even that, you have to have a guide to tell this is what you're hearing. Is this? Should I be hearing this? Should I be seeing this? What? I remember a long time ago when we first started having meditations, I was not myself too aware of you know, what happened. And there was a young girl, and we were meditating in the house. The young girl could, you know, she freaked out because she went into a meditation and she saw all of these ghastly looking faces inside and you know like wolves and vampire bats and all of this kind of stuff and I and she brought this to mind I didn't know what to tell her well, well just let it pass and saying we never saw her again and that was a failure on my part but I was not advanced to the point probably where I should have even been having meditations because I didn't realize I didn't realize that that person was coming to face to face with herself with symbolically those things which had caused her heartbreak and pain and fear and guilt, and they manifest themselves in these symbolic ways and they take on these characteristics in the mind of these awful looking animals or whatever. And when then, the beautiful thing is, when they come out into the light, then they can be dealt with. But 
they regress back deep into the subconscious where they cause us all of these psychological and, and physical problems. Well, I wasn't aware of that at that time. Now I am. But it's very, very important that people be there to hold the hand of someone who starts to enter into this new way. Because this is indeed is a new way. This way causes you to come out from amongst the religions and to start to make that walk, that pathway yourself. To be responsible for yourself, to see that there's a change within yourself and a movement upward into a higher realm. But it's not that easy when you begin if nobody is there to explain to you just what it's about and how does it happen. Two primary things then, meditation and listening. Why meditation? The reason that meditation is absolutely necessary is because you have a storehouse within you located in the right hemisphere of the brain. When you come and start doing in the beginning next week, you'll see about the Garden of Eden. You'll notice that it, actually the Garden of Eden is located in the right hemisphere of the brain. And it's very, very important that you have within you the ability to hear from that side. The wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding. Let me show you how important it is. Go now to um, page 847 in those little Bibles that you have there, and you'll come to the, to the point of Luke. Now we're going to look at Jesus and, and see a comment by Jesus and what he's got to say about it. He's talking to lawyers. Lawyers at that time, do you have the heat on in this, in this by any chance? Because whew, lawyers at that time, uh, it's starting to rise. I, I don't know if you're feeling it down there, but uh, uh, lawyers at that time were people who dwell in the law, in other words, the rules and the regulations of, of, of the Bible. And, and look what Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 11, page 847. And look what he says, Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of what? Knowledge. How come? You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. How important is it? What did he say? He didn't say you didn't go to Bible study. He didn't say uh, oh, you didn't go to church on Sunday morning. He didn't say uh, you didn't go to the seminary. He said you didn't enter within yourself. How serious it is. Here is the one that is claimed as the Lord, who is the Christ, who said you take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter within yourself. So, in other words, what he's saying here is that you can do a lot of listening, you can do a lot of studying, you can sign up for this school and that school. You can take a course in miracles and a course in this and a course in that. But if you don't meditate, then you're taking away the key that will transpose that knowledge or that information you have into enlightenment, into understanding, real understanding of yourself and that which you call God. So, okay. So that's the reason for meditation because as Jesus says, meditation is the key to knowledge, understanding. That's the key. Okay, so that's very, very, very important. The second thing is why listening, see? Now, when you start to practice your meditation, then you activate the right side. <sighs> Let me show you how this is done because for some of you, you've never seen this before. The only reason you should do this is because it's natural, all right? The sun in the sky on December the 21st goes through the constellation, the cross. It's crucified. It's the shortest day of the year. December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun sits at the bowels of the earth. It's the winter solstice. It's entombed three days and three nights. December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. Every day then becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. The sun enters into the water man Aquarius. The sun enters into the sign of Pisces, which compares it to that which is Jesus when he entered in with John the Baptist and selected his disciples, which were fishermen. On that which is the point where we are about now, the sun embraces the lamb or the pineal gland of the brain in, in respect to your head. But it, imp it embraces the constellation Aries, moves to the right side or the eastern sky in the northern hemisphere, and then summertime comes to the earth. It's a natural thing. It doesn't make any difference if you're Catholic, Baptist, Buddhist, Hindu. The point is, summer cannot come to the earth unless the sun is crucified, unless it sits three days and three nights in the winter solstice, unless it is born on December the 25th, unless it enters the baptism of the water man, unless it enters that which is the selection of the fish, and unless it embraces the land which it airs. Unless all of those things happen, the sun cannot sit in the right side or the eastern sky in the northern hemisphere, and summer cannot come. If it doesn't come this way, there's going to be no summer. If it doesn't, so the plan must be followed. 
The plan must be followed. Now the point then is, oh, that's fine for the, you know, for the sun, for the summer. We see it outside now. The spring is here. The trees are filled with their leaves again. But we say, well, what has it got to do with me? The point is that here in the, in the midst of your abdomen is the solar plexus. The sun must rise within you in the same way that it does outside. And it rises up after the crucifixion of the five senses through meditation, impacts the pineal gland of the brain, which is Aries, throws open the right hemisphere of the brain, and summertime comes to your life. In other words, there has been a barren, cold, winter existence inside of you. It has been dead. It will burst forth in color when you follow the exact same natural course that the sun follows in the sky. So that's why it's so very, very important. Now, if you'll take most people and you start talking to them about this and say, well, I don't know anything about it. I, I, I have never heard of anything like this. And Jesus comments on it. Look what he says, page 700 and 89, page 789, Matthew chapter 13. And it's a very interesting comment on the, on the human condition. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. And what does Jesus say? This people's heart is waxed gross. You know what that means? The center of their understanding is stifled. There's nothing. It's closed over. It's sealed. There's no way to get through. They pray. They go to church. They go to synagogue. They go to temple. But it's all hitting their ears and falling right down because the center is closed off. The center is totally closed off. For I say unto you, this people's heart is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. So in other words, what he's saying there is if the center is stifled, you're never going to be able to see these things. If the center is stifled, you're never going to be able to understand these things. And if the center is stifled, you can say you're saved, you can say you're religious, it's not going to mean anything. There's got to be an opening in the center. Okay. Now, the words are given to directly and purposely mislead. This is an interesting point. When you talk about words, and you talk about Eastern teachers, and Jehoshua was one, they deliberately deceived. The words were given in the Bible to deliberately deceive. And there's a reason for that. Okay? Jesus did the same thing, and I'll, and I'll show it to you. If you look at page 812 <coughs> in the little Bibles, uh, you look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And look what he says in verse 12. Okay? Unto you is given to know the mystery of what? The kingdom of God. Let's just, let's just put it up here for a minute. Here's the mystery, okay? This is very, very important. Unto you is given to know the mystery of what? The kingdom of God, all right? That's very important. Now, let's see what we should do about this kingdom of God. You want to go to church first? You want to read the Bible first, you want to join a club first, you want to uh, whatever you want to do. Let's see what the directions are. Go to page 782. That's jumping around a little bit, but it's important. Go to page 782, and what does Jesus say the very first thing that you must do? Okay. Before you get religious, before you decide to join the club, before you decide to get the Bible out, what does he say to do? Seek first. What? Seek first the kingdom of God. Look for it! Look for it! Search for it! Find it! It doesn't make any difference how much you read. So what? You can read from now until you drop dead with a book in your hand. You'll never find it. Why? Because it's located in a certain place. And he says the first thing you got to do before you do anything else is seek for it. And now I want you to turn to page 853, and he tells you where it's located. Page 853, you're looking at Luke chapter 17, and if you look at page 853, look what he says. Neither shall they say, Luke chapter 17, verse 21, neither shall they say it's here or it's there or it's anywhere, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within who? You! within you. So Jesus says, before you do anything else, before you do anything religious, before you do any studying of the Bible, before you get involved with any 
cults or organizations or groups or religions. Seek, look within yourself to find the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, what did he say? Let's go back to where we were. And the reason that this is very important. Go back to where we were. Go back to page 812. Look where we were in the, in the chapter mark. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Okay. Mark <coughs> chapter 4 and verse 11. What did Jesus say? Unto you. That's page... 812. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Unto you is given to know the mystery of what? The kingdom of God. In other words, unto you is given to know the mystery of yourself. And the biggest mystery, folks, that you have to deal with in this life is yourself. What's in here? What's going on? Who am I? What is my charger? What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to be going? But Jesus Christ said in Mark 4:11, "Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom, but to them that are without, remember what Jesus says? You take away the key because you don't end within yourself. All these things are done in what? Parables, symbolisms. It's a symbolic language. You can't take any of this stuff literally. It's not given literally. And look what I told you. What did I tell you a minute ago? They deliberately spoke this way to deceive you. And why does Jesus say in Mark 4.12 that he talks in parables? Look, that seeing they may see and not perceive. And hearing they may hear and not understand. Lest any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So the teachers of the East used a teaching method that if you would open to the inner recesses of the mind, you would understand. But if you stand out in the point of ego, if you stand out in the point of the all carnal mind, if you stand out in the way of the old traditional cutthroat religions of competitiveness, and this one's wrong and that one's wrong, this is what you'll see. You'll take it literally, and when you read the Bible, you'll have a whale swallowing a guy, pukes up an evangelist, and you bought it that way. You've got an ocean walking up and about 10,000 Egyptians run across chasing a bunch of Jews, and you bought it that way. You got a guy who gets his hair cut and he can't fight with anybody, and you bought all of these stories literally, and you missed entirely the deep mystical and the deep spiritual ramifications that are contained within them. Why? Because you didn't seek first within yourself. If you look within yourself, if you seek deeply within yourself, the right side opens up, you understand the kingdom of God which is within you, and then seeing you can see, hearing you can understand, and then you can be converted. What does it mean to be converted? To be converted means your mind is renewed. Your mind is changed from the way it used to be. You don't follow a, a religion. You don't follow a denomination. You follow that voice which whispers deep within you because now you have started to stimulate the pineal gland of the brain. You know what the pineal gland of the brain does? It does for a little goose. It makes a little goose fly from Canada and know it's going to land in Acapulco. It makes the little doggy know how to give birth. It makes the, uh, the robin fly from down south somewhere and find your backyard. It never misleads, but we've turned it off and it's atrophied because we haven't used it, but now Jesus is saying, stimulate yourself, look within yourself, and, and then look what he said. I speak this way so that they can't hear me. I speak this way so that they can't understand me, because this stuff is not to be given to people who function in the carnal mind because it's used just for the ruination and for the propagation of religion, and that's not what it's for. It's used to sanctify nature and to sanctify each one of us in this new age, in this new Aquarian factor of life and the restoration of the planet. There is a statement of Jesus Christ that points out the difference between the lower mind and the carnal. You have two aspects in you. We showed it this morning, okay? That's you. Over here you got the carnal mind. That's 10% of you. That's what tithing means. Did you know that? They take 10% of your money. Tithing has nothing to do with 10% of your money. It means give that 10%. This is the 90%, okay? This left side is you and me. That's called the carnal mind. Very important thing, but it's, a, it's the place of sensual desire. There's nothing wrong with it, except that's the cart. This is the horse over here, and what you have in most human beings is the cart is pulling the horse instead of the horse pulling the cart. You're getting into meditation with God, with Jesus, with Buddha, what Krishna is trying to say, have this side be the active side, have this side direct here instead of it being vice versa. Okay? Instead of your emotions telling you what to do, have that which is the spirit tell you what to do. Okay? So you have a carnal mind on the left side, you have that which is the divine mind 
on the right side, and now you're supposed to throw open the door to the right side and start to understand and learn things. Now look what says on page 782, look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. And it's an interesting statement. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Pearls are points of divine spiritual knowledge. That's what they mean in mysticism. Pearls of spiritual knowledge. Okay? Yeah, whatever. Pearls are spiritual knowledge. And those things which are called swine and dogs represent those aspects of the lower mind, the thoughts of the lower mind. And what Jesus is saying, okay, that you cannot deal with the things of the spirit in the realm of the lower mind because what's going to happen is that part of your lower mind is going to convince you this is no good. Now somebody could even be sitting in here. There's somebody that's sitting watching until I say, well, I can't handle this. You know, it's too complicated or all of this kind of stuff. And it's the most simple thing in the world. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to become part of any religion. You don't have to spend any money. All you have to do is get acquainted with yourself and the whole thing works. All you have to do is be willing to spend time with yourself. And Jesus is saying right here, okay, that you've got to refine these divine things in the right hemisphere of the brain. You can't try to entertain it in the left side. You can sit here and read these books and try to figure it out, and you've got to go completely contrary to what he said. He said, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to analyze it. Because as long as you try to figure it out, as long as you try to analyze it, your mind is going to creep in and say, uh, 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 and this is no good, and that's no good, and forget this, and forget that, and I got to go home, and I got to watch this, and I got to watch it. You can only come with this thing as you enter deep within yourself, lift yourself to that higher part of your consciousness, and let that beautiful thing that Buddha called nirvana enter in, and let the divine side then manifest itself within you. It's the only way it works. There is no other way. And so Jesus says, don't try. He's saying, don't try to be religious. Don't try to be someone who says, well, I know the Bible. Because all you've done with all of your knowledge of the Bible, all of the Bible scholars, all of the churches, all they've done is fight with each other and show bombs at one another, and bombs and drop guns at one another. Why? Because there's a competition within the mind. Jesus says, don't take this part. That's the dog. That's the swine. Just take this part. And that part goes without words. That part goes without any type of study. That part goes simply by your entering in and opening yourself. And as I told you, and as I think we found out in our experiences in meditation and our experiences in, in this work, that there's an evolution that's coming to us. When you qualify and when you are found to be deserving, you'll learn more, you'll understand more. More of the beautiful things that you're looking to happen will happen to you. Just like going to school, you're not going to get to the second year until you've qualified and proven that you're able to handle the first year. But you'll never make it if you try to figure it out intellectually. It's not an intellectual type of thing. It's given to the right hemisphere. And that's the pure place. Okay. No listening or studying without meditating. It's not possible. Now let's look at a perfect example of where Jesus was taken about casting your pearls before the swine. In John 3, 7, and you don't have to go there, what does Jesus say? And this is what he says. You must be born again. You must be born again. And, 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 of course, this is the foundation. This has become the, the, the whole crying point of millions of people in a particular sect that call themselves born-again Christians. You must be born again. Yet their understanding of this is totally void of the meaning given. How could, you know, Jesus comes up to a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus has got all of this religious trappings. He's got Bibles under his arms. He's got the religious hat on. He's got his robes on. And he said, what am I going to do? And Jesus takes one look at him and realizes there's nothing you can do. It's over because your mind is saturated with religion. Your mind is saturated with guilt. Your mind is saturated with fear. And Jesus says, you got to be born again. you got to start all over again. Oh, you say, no, he didn't mean that. He was talking about a spiritual thing. No, Jesus said in John, no, I don't want you to look. What page did I say that was on? What is it? Come on, wake up, let's go. John, what? All right, look at page, what page? Somebody yell out to me what the page is. John, somebody yell out. John 3, what page is it on? Huh? 866. Okay, now what is Jesus talking, you tell me, what is Jesus talking about? Is he talking about spiritual things? 
Come on, lady, tell me what's he talking about. Is he talking about spiritual things? Or is he talking about physical things? Is he talking about earthly things? Is he saying you really have to be born again because you didn't get it this time around? You know, you let religion take you and you let them mold your mind and everything I tell you now, you're going to doubt it because you're going to compare it with your religion. Look what Jesus says, chapter 3, uh, verse 7, marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. Now look what he says in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? He says, you've got to start all over. There's no way. You've made up your mind. You've reached a conclusion. And when you've reached a conclusion, your journey is concluded. So what happens? What do they do? If someone says something in a church, they're born again. And this is what they do. They say, close your eyes. Everybody bow your head. Stick up your hand. Don't let anybody look around. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Okay. Now. The next step, come up and sign the card. I sign the card. You sign the card. You're born again. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You made it. What'd you do? I don't know. I signed the card, but I'm born again. What has happened in here? Fakakta has happened in here. Nothing has happened. I don't know nothing. I didn't do nothing. What am I here for? All I know is I'm born again. <laughs> when do you get the good stuff? When you die. After you drop dead, you get your bonus. This is great. Am I happy? Oh, I can't wait. For what? I want to die. What do I tell the people this morning? I'm going to make you a deal. I love Jimmy Buffett. I want to go see Jimmy Buffett or Rod Stewart. I want to go to see a con. Here, what would, you, what would you rather do? Would you rather die tonight? How about we just shoot everybody? You die tonight, and tomorrow you can be with Jesus. Or would you rather go see Jimmy Buffett Saturday? You know what? You go see Jimmy Buffett. Because nobody wants to go see Jesus. Why? Because you got to die. And you know what? Nobody wants to die. Why? Because that's stupid. <laughs> Is it stupid? That's the deal. I'm going to die to go to heaven. Then I hell with it. You go. I ain't going. I'm staying here with Jimmy Buffett. That's the end of that. <laughs> See? If it was natural, you would want to die. It's not natural. You want to live. So what does Jesus say? Does he support that stupid proposition? No. He said, God is not a God of the dead. God is a God of the living. What does it mean? Like, Reverend Ike said, get your cake and ice cream now. Put a cherry on top of it now. Because you ain't going to die anyhow. You're going to get out of that suit you're wearing now. You're going to jump into another one. And here you come again. You're going to shoot at it forever. Because you're always going to be alive and living. And so this is it. A born-again experience never takes place in their mind because there's never been any change. There's never been any renewal in here. Say, you gotta be, doesn't it make sense to you? Are you awake? Does it make any sense to you? Don't you want to have something? Don't you want to find out? Don't you want to figure out what the heck you're doing here? You're getting older and older and older, and then pretty soon, you know what happens? We get like, you come down here, this is us. Uh, we're alive, and we go through life, and then you roll off the end. And then you know what? No sooner they got you put in the box, here comes another one. And they're rolling off the end all day. And there's undertakers picking them up and putting them in boxes and sticking newspaper in their mouth and give them half a suit to wear and say, oh boy, they look good. Yeah, that'll be 6,000, lady. Is this great? No, and you have learned nothing. You want, to, you want to understand. Just a simple thing. What's the simple thing we've done? I want everybody sitting in this room to yell out, what is this? It's not really a tree. It's an ornament. Okay, but it's pretty good. You know what it's for? To decorate the room. What is this? Gongs. To make noise and to decorate the room. What is this? This is a speaker to hold a thing. This is what? Guess what this is? This is a chair. And you know what's in the chair? What are the screws for? Come on. To hold the chair together. Aren't you wise? Now, I want you to do this for me, please. This is the most important part. Turn and look at somebody sitting in here. What are they for? I don't know. They're just here, that's all. We're here so that when we die, we can get our reward. Get Get real! As Jane Rivers says, can we talk? Joan Rivers. See? So what I am saying is, 
in order for there to be a semblance of reason, you must renew your mind. Must be new things come into your mind. All of that old stuff's got. Now, how do I know that? How do I know? Come on, you can all sing. How do I know the Bible? Okay, you're really good. Let's go. Page 928. Look at the Bible. The Bible in chapter 12. What is it? Well, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Okay. I'm getting wound up now. We're ready to go. All right. We're right. We're ready to go. But is it making any sense? That's all that counts. If it makes sense. <laughs> Okay, Romans chapter 12. What does it say in verse 2? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what Jesus was trying to get through. But how are you going to get your mind renewed when you find out that God killed this guy and that saves you? So all you got to do is say, I'll take it, and you go to heaven. What good is it? A long time ago... I sat with God, and I said, and this is true, I've told many of you this before, but I said to him, look, this world is screwed up. I said, but I want to just ask you a question. Is it true that you couldn't figure out any other way to forgive me but then by torturing Jesus to death? And if you say yes, I want to tell you right now, I don't want any part of you. Because if you did that, you're more bizarre than the people that tell the story. And, and if you've done that, then what hope is there for the rest of us? If, if this is the best you could do, what are we expected to do? And then, after this, God, you, 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 you tortured this fellow to death, and, and now you're cooking up Armageddon? What is it? What's the matter with you? You should go to counseling. <laughs> really, what's the matter with this guy? He kills a guy, a young guy who never hurt anybody, and now he's planning a nuclear war. And, and, and his name is Love. Is this something? Strange Love, Dr. Strange. But you know the good part, I found out that it's not true. I found the beautiful part that it's not true when we read the story in the Gospel of Thomas that John was having trouble with the crucifixion and he ran up into the cave and saw Jesus standing there and they both laughed because it's a symbolic transformation. It's a crucifixion within yourself. The Jesus part of you must be crucified, which is the flesh, so that the Christ part of you then can rise up into the higher realms of consciousness and open to you the loveliness of nature and the beauty of this world, which is not sick, which is not dying, which is magnificent. It's a jewel in the universe, and it's given unto you. That's beautiful. So the pearl of a new birth of consciousness is trampled, do you see, by the lower mind. Do you see what he said? Don't cast your pearls before the swine. They'll trample them. You take the born-again experience, which is a renewal of the mind, a new mind, a rebirth into this life if need be, but what is it changed into? How did, the, how did they trample it? It's turned out to be raise your hand and sign a card, and then go back to your chair, and we'll give you some literature. I used to say, hey, literature. <laughs> God, will you say, God, give me literature. <laughs> Jesus. And I said, this is all I got. It cost me 50 bucks, I got literature and a card, and I'm saved. From what? From what? The guy's going to repossess the car. I'm saved? Let's see if it happens. He did go home, the car's gone. What? I didn't get saved. Why? Because I have done nothing within myself to come to grips with the mind or the spirit. Now, how does the Bible comment on it? Okay, go to page 627. We're not that far from being done, so don't get too fidgety. Jeremiah chapter 5. What does it say? Okay. 627. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 5, look at verse 31. You want to read it with me? Do you want to see it in living black and white? The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? You listen to them. I mean, Billy Graham, he must be telling the truth. I mean, he's a wonderful man, clean-cut guy, never stole anything. He wouldn't do anything wrong, and you know that. I mean, that's like George Washington or whatever. I mean, he's, what could he, how, he must be right. But according to this, there's a way that even he doesn't know. 
because he has an allegiance to a church. And he's been very faithful to it. And a lot of people have come out and gotten literature and come down through the thing and walked back up, but they never knew that there was something inside of them that had to be changed. It's an individual thing. It's a beautiful individual thing. But on the other hand, if you take this born-again pearl and nature it in the divine, pure aspect of conscious perfection and meditation, then something beautiful happens for you, for your family, for your children, for your animals, for nature. Because, don't you see, once the wars stop in here, then there'll be peace out there. And for nature, too. All of the beautiful things that will happen. In religion, and you have a Bible in your hand, there was no holier, more religious group that ever walked the face of the earth than a group called Pharisees. And Jesus Christ couldn't stand in one of them. So they're a bunch of hypocrites. Your real development depends on your reaching a higher level. And how did Jesus say to find it? Go to page 886, John chapter 21. Page 886, John chapter 21. What did Jesus say in verse 6? Cast your net on the right side of the ship and you'll find. Throw your energy to the right hemisphere of the brain and you'll find what? You'll find wisdom. You'll find understanding. You'll know. You'll find fish. Fish are a, sim a symbol of brain food. You'll find intelligence. You'll find knowledge. Cash. What is he, a magician? Is he black stone? Who's the other guy that goes down to Atlanta City? The guy? <coughs> huh? Copperfield. Is he Copperfield? You throw your net on the right side, he catches fish, and he should go get a job in Atlantic City. He'd make a lot of money. That's not what he's saying. Cast your energy to the right side. And we know that because they catch 153 fish, which is not what we'll go through. So, the objective of sacred writing, then, is to assist you in reaching a higher level. And that's the point of all this. So your sacred writings come to you in two aspects as we wrap this up. One, literal. Okay? Literal. You understand. Literal. Let's all think of one literally. The Jews running away from Egypt come to the Red Sea. Moses looks up and the Red Sea parts and they make a way across to the other side. That's literal. Okay? You believe it? It never happened. It's amazing that anybody even questions that it could have possibly happened. I mean, there's no greater bunch of people who kept records of history than the Egyptians, and it never happened. What's the key? C is emotions. The color red is emotions. That's why the devil wears a red suit. That's why the bull sees a red flag and all this. Red means the emotions. When you come to the emotions and they're churning within you, you look upward in your meditation and a way is made across and you're able to cross to the other side of the promised land. You move from the left side to the right hemisphere of the brain. Because why? You have lifted yourself up and the sea has parted. The emotions has been split in two. They no longer provide a barrier to you in the success of your life. You are now free to cross to the other side. Is that nice? Or would you rather believe that this guy was chasing a bunch of Jewish beggars across the desert and then took his chariots and ran into the sea? For what? Tell me, give me for what reason? For, obviously, to prove the power of God. He's nobody that believes it anyhow. How could you believe such a thing? It doesn't happen. It didn't happen. Nobody recorded it. Nobody made a record of it. The guy that was the Egyptian pharaoh was supposed to have gone in there and got swallowed up by the sea. He's buried. He's got a tomb in, in Cairo somewhere. What is his name? King Tut, King Tutmosa, Ramses, or something like that. <laughs> so, when you take the literal meaning, in meditation, the literal meaning is transformed, and the divine ray, the light of natural understanding within yourself begins to glow. That's the beautiful part of this. So the parable connects the lower meaning, transforms it into a higher meaning, the words then become transformation of your life, and your mind is transformed. A very simple way, that is given, and I promise you this is it. We'll end it with this. Let me show you the very simple way. You use that which is the four aspects of nature. You use earth, okay? You use water, you use air, and you use fire. You use those four natural elements. And that's how this is done. You know what that is? You should know. In religion, it's called baptism. 
See, and that's what you do. This is how you take the pearl and it's trampled. Because what you do in order to get baptized, you take children and you pour water on their head. You take yourself and they put you in a tank and submerge you and they hold you under or put you in a creek down here and you get all kinds of flu and everything because it's all polluted and they say, aren't you wonderful? And then, then you come up and you say, I'm saved. But you never stop to think, this same God that, that, that tortured the guy to death and he's planning an atomic war, he's not going to get his rocks or his kicks off until you, you sink your head in the water. He wants to see Ethel with her head wet. This is great. I love this. I'm telling you, this, uh, Jesus, this is great. Watch this one. <laughs> is this great or what? <laughs> They're all, look at them, all heads are wet. Look at the hair on Ethel. Oh, this is terrific. Save them all. What kind of a joke is this? Sorry, what kind of a joke? Let me show you something. <laughs> Go to page 979, then we're done. Yeah, I really am. Come on. D d come on. I didn't hear one page. Nobody's going anywhere. It's a revolution on my hands. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6. Go to verse 1. What is, G what is the Apostle Paul said? Leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Do you see that? What does he say? You should stop. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, or the doctrines of yeah. baptism. In other words, stop this. Stop this. Don't, don't put any more people's heads in the water. Don't, don't dip any more heads in the water. Why? Come on with me. Watch this real, kick, real carefully. This is what it is. It's the four natural ones. The earth is your mind. That's your mind. Okay? That's the first stage of consciousness in every language in the world. The second stage of consciousness is water. It's the truth. So you raise your mind to the second stage of consciousness. When you have raised your mind to the second stage of consciousness, you then become wet with the truth. You, what you have done tonight is you've been baptized. You've taken your mind and you've exposed it to the water, which is the truth. Okay? After you do this, what do you do when they take you? You come up out of the water, if you're lucky and if the pastor likes you. Okay? What happens here? You come up from the water, which is the truth, into the third stage of consciousness, which is air, which is nothingness. That's when Jesus says, take no thought. When you've reached the air. That's where it says in the Bible, we will raise and meet Jesus in the air. It means this is where you'll touch him and that which is the third stage of consciousness. When you come up out of that third stage of consciousness, you then touch the fourth, which is fire or spirit, and your mind is renewed. That's baptism. You've been baptized. Not by sticking your head in a toilet somewhere and pushing the, flushing the doggone thing and saying, oh, my head is wet, this is wonderful, I am saved. No, you take your mind, you elevate it to the truth of that which are the teachings of Christ of the inner mind, you raise yourself up beyond that into nirvana or that which is the air or the third stage of consciousness where there is no thought, and then you are touched in the fourth stage. So you've used the four elements of earth, water, air, fire, and you have a baptism. If you understand that, then you have nurtured that pearl and it becomes a pearl of great price. If you have, on the other hand, decided to take this intellectually and take this literally, you will tramp down to the river with millions of other people and then you will see the earth being destroyed by violence and rape and drugs and all of the other things because nobody has ever been baptized. Nobody has ever been baptized because they've stuck their head in real water instead of coming to grips with the truth of what the Christ taught. And they've come up into the air and breathed real air instead of coming up into the air of no thought and breathing that which is nirvana. And they've never been touched by that. They've been touched with the emotions. They've never been touched with that which is the real spirit of the fourth stage of consciousness. So this creates an entire new realm of consciousness and an entire new realm of understanding. And it's up to you. And that's the beautiful part. <laughs> you don't join any group. You don't spend any money. It's up to you. If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. It's none of my business. It is absolutely none of my business. And nobody can make you, and nobody can unmake you. Nobody can tell you you have to believe it because you don't have to believe it. But you can compare it with the things that you've learned in the past, and you can say, gee, does this make sense? Does it make sense from a psychological standpoint? If I had a psychiatrist in here, if I had a psychologist in here, would he say that makes sense? Yeah, he would say it would make sense. On the other hand, if I say, well, we can really get this person straightened out by dicking their head in the toilet, would he say that makes sense? No, it doesn't make any sense. And so then, it, it just comes to the point of understanding Jesus. Wisdom is known by her children. What are the results of the things that we've done in the past. Take a look at the world. 
Take a look at what we've done to the children. Take a look at what we've done to the animals. Take a look at what we've done to the ecology. Take a look at what we've done to each other. Take a look at what religion has done to nations as they drop their bombs in the name of God. Whether it be the Crusades, whether it be the Inquisition, whether it be the wars in Israel, whether it be the wars in Ireland, whether it be the wars in Bosnia, wherever they are, wherever the church raves its flag, bombs are soon to follow. That's good? No. You should want no part of it. And there is no God in the universe that kills people in order to be able to forgive somebody else. It never happened. Never was meant to happen. It's all a metaphysical talk, a mystical talk about the crucifixion that takes place in here so that the Jesus who is your flesh can die and rise and become the Christ who is your new mind. And it's up to you. Thank you very much for sharing this time. And uh, we'll see you down the next bend of the road. Thank